What could I possibly do with them at this hour of the night? Want a suggestion? You're not very funny, Hardy. <laughs> Nighty night. Hark, it's an 87th Precinct podcast side pod. We're stepping away from the world of the 87th Precinct. Not very far away, we're just taking a little sort of parallel universe sidestep into New York and a film based on a story by Evan Hunter, Ed McBain. The story was published in 1959 as a matter of conviction and the film, which came out in 1961, was The Young Savages, a black and white film about gang violence and murder and courtroom drama set in New York in the slums of uh, Harlem and the various different areas. Something that Evan Hunter knew very well himself and obviously talked about in some of his books. Part of the reason we're doing it is because the book before last, was it, that we did? I think so. Was Uh See Them Die from the 87th Precinct series, which was, again, a story about gangs in these Harlem slums, basically. And we've just watched the film and we're going to have a little chat about it and I'll give you some information. So, to talk about the film and surrounding items, I have subpoenaed two witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> and that is uh, Mr. Stephen Royston. Hello. And Mr. Morgan Brown. Present. Present, yes. <laughs> the court will record that the witnesses <laughs> are in attendance. That's the sort of thing they say. Hopefully, I don't need gagging <laughs> well, or well, well, restraining. We'll see how we go on. We never know. <laughs> So we've got a double whammy of uh, spoiler policy here in that if you haven't seen the film or you haven't read the book, well, tough, because otherwise we have nothing to talk about. <laughs> Very true. Have you read the book? I have read the book. Oh, I right. read it this week in advance. You're well ahead of us then. For I have not read the book. Nor well, have I. Just before we get into it then, could Steve, could you describe the edition of... We normally <laughs> in our bonus episodes we do a description of the books and things, but Steve might describe well, the, the cover of A Matter the, of Conviction. The, the cover of Matter of Conviction looks like... Uh, the VHS cover for Emmanuel II, or <laughs> you would so, so, something like that. Definitely think it was going to be a disappointing the, soft pornography. The softest <laughs> of of soft core pornography, <laughs> with a guy with I think he's wearing pajamas with Lovely. a naked torso, holding a, a lady with uh, just uh, some um, slightly baggy b- baggy pants, <laughs> baggy pants, with her back to the uh, the camera. So what would you and it seems to have absolutely no bearing to the film I've watched, or uh, I'd imagine to the probably book. Probably to the book, so it's quite perplexing, really. What would you imagine the story was about? Seeing that cover of the of the so some people? some crime of passion involving uh, uh, not even a crime, uh, just sort of well, yeah. Mills and Boone. Well, yeah, Mills More and Boone. More or less, yeah. yeah. It's. Um, Definitely, sort of. Yeah, it's it's quite strange, really. But then the back there's a quite a large picture of Evan Hunter, it's looking, quite looking quite like, uh, is, looking very much good. like Steve Carella. It, it, I would have been more tempted to read the book if that had been on the front rather than. So yes, a very Gerald perplexing, a member, very perplexing or... uh, cover. Uh, well, the we reason for agree. that cover being the way it is, or well, or do you know why? Well, not because of the content of the cover, oh. not because of that picture being the picture that it is. It, it doesn't bear any relation to the book. Mm. I can confirm that. Oh, there is some talk of, of grown-up cuddling, mm. and, <laughs> which is basically what the cover of the book is. Yes. But, it, yeah, it doesn't bear resemblance. The edition I've got is by the New English Library in their four-square edition from 1968. The New English Library, who have got a couple of the McBains in those, they were a, very much a pulp publisher. Oh, right. And so as they got into the late 60s, they got less bothered about actually publishing hmm. established authors and things like that. But they would buy up some, which is why they've got a matter of conviction from 1959. But they was, they started putting out loads of stuff about, I think, biker gangs and the like. Yeah. Mm. And they just had about two or three authors who just churned out tons and tons yeah. of these things. So they were very pulpy and so this just, just matches basically the types of covers they were doing at the time yeah. which is semi photograph well photographic and sort of semi porny type things. You'd have thought like they could have come up with something sensationalist related to gang violence that would still have been a bit sexy but would have tied in a bit the, more with the theme but yeah, I don't know. The, the font choice is quite sophisticated though. It, it, it does of, it looks uh, a bit more like a kind of like uh, an erotic love story for adults. Yes. 
I suspect it might. It was simply a matter of conviction <laughs> <laughs> that he held her in his arms. I, I'd, I'd love to, to, to hear your audio book of it. <laughs> that would be very nice. Yeah, it's very strange. It was originally published by Simon and Schuster, who did yeah. all the uh, Eight Seven Precinct stuff, and it has been reprinted since by the Mysterious Press, but published as an Ed McBain novel. Ah. Ed McBain writing as Evan Hunter, whereas the truth is it was Evan Hunter writing as Evan Hunter. <laughs> yeah. So, but I think Ed McBain was the more famous name, mm. or he is now anyway. Yeah. And has the sort of the the more crimey legacy and this mm. is big, this is a crime book really effectively yeah so yeah it's a it's a very interesting cover i will post it on the on the <laughs> twitter and instagram and all those various places that i'm sure you all visit all the time anyway so that's that's the book and i'll i'll drop in some points having read it well, as we talk about the film which is the main reason we're here but before we get into that actually before we get into anything If you want to follow up about anything about Pulp Fiction, I wrote an article, a review in the We Are Cult online magazine about a book called Girl Gangs, Biker Boys and Real Cool Cats, edited by Andrew Nett and Ian McIntyre, which is a really, really good book all about Pulp Fiction. And there's one chapter in there all about Ed McBain's early works called Evan Hunter's Jungle Kids, which mainly covers uh, the Blackboard Jungle and A Matter of Conviction. Because obviously they were big... Stories in what was called the JD scene, the juvenile delinquency pulp fiction scene. So there's a very good article in there by Matthew Asprey Gear. So you can look that up on the We Are Cult website if you want to read about that. And if you like pulp fiction, which if you're one of our listeners, you may well do, then that is the the Girl Gangs Biker Boys book is is a very good overview of loads and loads of different publishers, authors, and loads of great images and the like. So I wanted to mention that before we moved on, and now we will. Move on. I've got a day-to-day mystery I need help with before we go mm-hmm. any further. It's a crime. A crime has been committed on my property. And I, I think you guys... I'm, I'm turning right to you rather than the police okay. to try and help me with this. Okay. We are the experts. Let me all. lay out the scenario. Two days ago, we come home from work. Our wheelie bin for recycling, our blue wheeled bin, yes. is outside the front of our house. It doesn't have the number of our house on it, as so many bins do, to identify them once they've been moved around the place by the bin men. However, on returning home, our bin now has a sticker on the top of it with our house number on it. Mm. Mm. Maybe, said my partner, maybe the council have been around and stuck them on all the bins. They have not. Someone has defaced our bin in a really helpful way (laughs) by sticking our house number on it. (laughs) <laughs> and I just do not know why. And I feel violated. Well, understand. I think I'd be tempted to rip it off. But it's useful and saves me we, doing we, it. We need to stamp well, out this helpful vandalism. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's encroaching on your right to number your bin yourself. Yeah, See, so I, I purposely have not numbered my bin and forced my neighbour into numbering his bin. <laughs> and I can thus identify my bin because he's numbered his. How long did that standoff take? I uh, don't know, ten years. <laughs> a mere ten Eight years. years but the, years the victory must have tasted so sweet. Well, at the end of the day, who cares whose <laughs> bin is whose? They're all flipping empty and they're all the same. Well, I'm... I'm so, yes. I'm a bit concerned because my bin's quite new because someone did steal my old bin. Some busybody neighbour, I would say. But why us? It feels like the start of a, of a campaign. Well, have you... Looked at the other bins. I have. I've looked at the other bins. There's no evidence of stickers on them, even on the unlabeled mm. ones. Mm. So there you go. There's Strange. a bizarre mystery. Perhaps and, they did it as a matter of conviction. Well, yes, a matter of conviction, <laughs> which is a classic Evan Hunter, Ed McBain title, because the book is all about the character Hank Bell's feelings mm. about why he's convicting some boys or why he's going to try and convict some boys. He is a assistant district attorney, prosecuting some gang members. So you've got his feelings and convictions about why he's doing it and the purposes behind it, and obviously conviction as in doing the convicting type thing. So that's a classic double-meaning yeah. Evan Hunter thing. He's not keen on having a title that has a single meaning, really, is he? No. But when it gets to this film, Burt Lancaster as our hero, Hank Bell, mm-hmm. the film becomes The Young Savages. Mm-hmm. Which is a, a title much more in the vein of the JD films of the of the time. They're Absolutely. certainly savages, but they certainly ain't young. 
<laughs> from the actors who were recruited in this film. Well, yeah, the main three kids are supposed to be 15, 16, 17 or something like that. Pushing and 35. Yeah, they're, they're, they're all at least 10 years older. Than which, uh, yeah, which was amusing, really. But yeah, he, yeah, It's always funny when you watch a film that's supposed <laughs> to have like kids in it and you know that they've had to cast people older. A lot of the time, they can they can get it right. They they cast people who are older but look the mm. age. Yeah, they had receding hairlines for God's sake. Yeah. That's not to say that some teenagers don't <laughs> this suffer is true. from that. This is true. But Shelley Winter's son looked old enough to be her husband. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that explains why he was so mixed up. Well, in his, yeah, maybe his feelings yeah. and his uh... anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a couple of names from the cast. There we've got Burt Lancaster playing. Hank Bell. Yep. We've got Shelley Winters playing Mary DiPacci. We've got oh, let's have a look at me names. Telly Savalas. We've got Telly Savalas playing the the main copper in it. Absolutely. I mean, curiously, yeah. he looked older than he did when he was in Kojak. He's smoking about... cigars constantly in it as yeah, well, isn't it? He's got true. a pocket full of about four or five cigars at any one time. He, he was very good actually. We've got John Davis Chandler as Arthur Reardon, who is the main hoodlum. Mm. And he was a face that when he came on screen, I think all of us went, we've seen that face before, mm. because yeah. it's quite a memorable face. Oh, it, it really is. And it evokes strong emotions of a weaselly nature. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's certainly got weaselly um, connotations. Does mm. the face have connotations? Yeah, that one does. It certainly does. So it's not a bad cast, actually. I mean, it's regardless of the fact, it's quite hard, I think, for them to cast actors who'd be good enough mm, yeah. to do the roles which is why you get these people who are older as as well as the laws about using young people to mm. act in things but yeah it's, I think it's a pretty well cast film in terms of how they, yeah. how they act and how they play it Definitely, and some of the gang yeah. members are really good mm. too many of them to, to know and they're not all credited as well mm. it's a John Frankenheimer film he directed it and I obviously looked him up so what was the film you were talking about that was well, John Frankenheimer? Well, I, 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 yeah, I remember as soon as I saw his name popped up. The, the Train, which is an excellent film about the Germans in the Second World War trying to nick all the French art in the dying uh, in the dying days of the war and so to ensure that the artwork doesn't escape from, from France as an elaborate plan to um, the loads, mess up the train it. journey. Mm. Yeah. And, and Burt Lancaster is in, in that film in the and lead fact, as well. And in fact, yeah, I think a lot of the people who produced this film in terms of the crew and, and mm. were, were involved in, in the train, as I think oh. they were on a, on a few different films. The Birdman of Alcatraz. Which yeah, is the Birdman other, of Al- Alcatraz. The Frankenheimer, oh, Lancaster collaboration. And John Frankenheimer also made The Manchurian Candidate. Mm-hmm. He was directing till you know, well into the 90s, I think. Yeah, I think he did. Incredibly long career. For a very long time. He was doing a lot of TV, and I think this film, The Young Savages, was his first motion picture. Oh, right. He'd done TV films and TV series, but this was his first motion picture, and he took a lot of the people who worked on on it with him, Hmm. like music and cinematography and all that sort of stuff. I swear, one thing that I sort of feel a bit sad about with this film is it doesn't have any crazy rock and roll scenes in it which so many of them did at the time I, I feel like he missed a trick there like the, the, the soundtrack where it comes in where there's any kind of hint of popular music it's always like kind of like cool jazz rather than any kind of like rowdy youth music really isn't it it's, uh, I think because they're going for the gritty thing aren't they yeah, rather than so, yeah. sort of making it like they're not trying with this film to appeal to the 15 year old it's not, not really them. kind of youth exploitation, is it which I it would have been so good as a youth exploitation movie. It would have been great if they'd have just yeah. Suddenly there was like a they were down a beat club at some point. Yeah, if they'd been just just like no, they didn't have to go full on kind of along those lines, but just like sort of five percent of high school Hellcats in there would have uh, raised the bar, I think. Yeah, there was a little bit of uh, sort of jazz slang. Oh yes, a bit of Hepcat slang, wasn't there? <laughs> and hopefully you won't be listening to this thinking these guys are utterly cubistic. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm assuming is taking the concept of being square yep. and then moving it into three dimensions. Absolutely. Oh, that's sounds so much worse, yeah. You're not just one square, you're six squares Oof. and all the space in between <laughs> the various sides. So cubistic, daddy And my other two notes I made about the slang in this were when Danny DiPacci, one of the gang members, or one of the, one of the hoodlums, says, Ram it! When offered <laughs> something and... Uh, Goes a cigarette. Tough and a half. <laughs> so it's not just, oh, that's tough, mate. It's mm. like, that's tough and a half. Nice. Oh, that's very tough, isn't it? Tough and a half. Ooh. 
That's tremendously 50% more tough. tough than you were expecting. Absolutely. It's a story about gangs. It's a story about a stabbing. It opens with a stabbing, as the book does. How did you feel about the structure of it? Because it plays out episodically, sort of, doesn't it? Does. It does. It was, yeah, no, it, it, it adopts the, um, yeah, the, I don't know what the word is, the, um, the structure, I suppose, of... Uh, you, you think you've seen everything because mm. it's played out right at the beginning in like the first scenes yeah. almost, and then the rest of the film is an investigation of something that you think you know yeah. everything about for the rest of the film. Yeah, it and makes the audience all witnesses of of the crime immediately, so you kind of feel like yeah, you're sort of omniscient while you're watching them all f- figure out things you think you already know, and then. It reminded me of a Dario Argento film, which, uh, which, mm, which is it? The Bird with the Crystal Plume, one of the early ones where you see the crime at the beginning, hmm. and you're absolutely certain you know what happened, and yet it turns out that perhaps you didn't. And it's similar, similar yeah. kind of mechanism to that, really. It, it's, it's. I, I think it follows a pattern that that you see in a lot of much more recent courtroom dramas. I don't know if it was if this was really an established genre kind of earlier or not, where you have this whole build up to this court case, and that's kind of the focal piece of the film, and then some obviously there's a, a last minute bit of evidence that twists everything completely, mm. and yeah. That's and that's kind of it. It's a really standard thing now. And if you see a courtroom scene coming up, you kind of know now that that's going to happen. Yeah, definitely. But I think, that, again, that's, a, that's an Evan Hunter writing trait. Or certainly well, you know, Edmund yeah, Bain as well. Yeah, is that yeah, last yeah. minute oh, discovery yeah. or twist. That definitely, that turns yeah. everything on its head. That enables the story to end in some mm. way. Well, the majority of the film is spent with Burt Lancaster on his quest for the truth. Whether yeah. it's uh, inconvenient to his uh, employers or unfortunate for the the family yeah. of the the victim, or which doesn't necessarily shed that much more light on the actual crime, but does fill in a lot of social background mm. and and give you a lot of more kind of colour surrounding the the characters in this, which is, is I think what makes a lot of the interest of it. Yeah, and then because it's definitely sort of a lot of the the tension in the film comes between sort of the political side of it, which is the need to get this high-profile conviction for, for political purposes. and Get then, them in the chair. Yeah, and then the kind of social justice side of it um, and which side of that will win out and whether the goals of the two things are actually the same or whether they're different. Rather than any details of the crime, that's kind of what you learn about as the film progresses. And then, obviously, we have this sort of revelation later on. Which mm. There's a line in uh, a Monty Python sketch, which is, it's a fair cop, but society is to blame. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and uh, that's, that could be sort of part of the, the, the moral background of this story mm. as well. A lot of the colour in this story, which is, I think it actually seems very authentic. I mean, sometimes the sets seem a bit stagey, some of the... Some of oh, the, yeah, I mean... But, but actually, loads of the, the sort of the filming and the colour of, of the streets is really interesting. Yeah, oh. yeah. No, and I think it was mainly, it must have been filmed around Harlem. I, I, I think there's, it does seem like a lot of authentic location shots, definitely. You it's, see a lot of the rebuilding that McBain's talked about in, in some of the 87th Precinct books, mm-hmm. if we're assuming, as we generally do, that they're just ciphers for the real New York. Mm-hmm. This is set in the real New mm-hmm. York. Well, the, the escape over like a, an entire set. block's block of demolished buildings mm. do you not think it looked like Liverpool like those pictures of Liverpool Very you see in the 60s like, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. whereas instead of us knocking it down to rebuild it because of old houses we were knocking stuff down because it had been bombed, bombed in, yeah. in Liverpool but it looked very much like a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. So that would have been a very familiar landscape across quite a lot of, of places, I think. Sort of old buildings knocked down, sort of patches of waste ground and, and sort of Definitely. slum terrace housing or tenements as it would have been in New York. Yeah, sort of tenements running up against just sort of demolition sites. And yeah. And this is, this is the world that Evan Hunter was born into. Mm-hmm. I've been doing a bit of research into his family tree, and when you look at some of the lists on the censuses of how many people lived in one room, in one flat, in one apartment block, and then how many families lived in that apartment block in total, and then you mm. sort of try and multiply that across the idea of how many floors there would have been, how many houses in a row, it's ludicrous to think how many people would have been crammed into these conditions, oh, yeah. which were sort of squalor, really. Mm. And that's represented quite well on the couple of scenes where you go inside into the slums 
because it's like a one room or two room building. Mm. But one room's got all of the family in, and, and then the sort of kid who's a bit of a gang leader's sort of got his own room off to the side. Mm-hmm. But the, the one bedroom that's available, yeah. whereas there's grandparents and parents all all living together. So I thought that was quite good. I enjoyed I enjoyed that bit of colour. And then a lot of it comes from the flashbacks. Mm. So a lot of it is told in flashback. Mm. Right, yeah. And just to um, reveal something to the book, I'll just pass that to Morgan there. I'm just showing Morgan how the book's laid out for the flashback scenes. So the film does really reflect the book because the book has these flashback scenes written in script format. Absolutely, yeah. Wow. So I wonder whether Evan Hunter was thinking of this visually, maybe, thinking of it like a... TV script or film script at the time when he wrote this because so much of that book the flashbacks are yeah. all absolutely film it's, script it's, style it's, yeah the, the, even down to sort of stage directions and everything yeah it's it's that's wild he does that in the 80s some of the 87th precinct when he's like interrogating he'll uh, oh yeah oh, in the interrogation sequences mm-hmm. he'll do but this is this is written mm-hmm. with like sta- yeah stage direction settings and almost like you can you know he's explaining the shots as they would be in which mm-hmm. is is really interesting. So that was something that was, I found quite interesting mm. in the book, and it was nice to see in the film that they've reflected that by having these flashback sequences, which more or less do the same mm. thing. There's some intense music as, at the start, oh, isn't there? And the, and the, 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 three, the three villains of the piece are going off to do a stabbing, and they're walking in step. Mm. It looks a bit silly, because the walking in step is then obviously tied in, <laughs> into yeah. the score music. And so it takes away a little bit of the the threat of them because they do a little bit look a little bit like they're doing a dance number. Mm. That's true. It's like some kind of weird discordant circus march or something. It's it's a bit peculiar. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, how would it have seemed like a dramatic thing at the time? Would people have been shocked? Do you think by the the violence that was played out on screen? It was obviously a big social and moral panic at the time. But yeah, I'm not sure. I, you you only see one stabbing. You see a couple of beatings. It's a few years on from the sort of initial juvenile delinquent panic, isn't it? So I don't know how <laughs> shocking that would have been yeah. at that stage. But I'm just looking through a review from the New York Times, a contemporary review from uh, 25th of May 1961. And what it says here is that the film is obviously pegged on evidence presented in the well-reported case of the gang murder of the crippled boy Michael Farmer, slain in Highbridge Park a a few years ago, and a couple of other juvenile slayings. So, involving Puerto Rican youths known as the Cape Man and the Umbrella Man. Ooh. We do have a Cape Man in this, don't we? We have a character who goes by the name of Batman. That's right, yeah. Mm. And it's... I know Batman's been around a long time in comics, Mm -hmm. but I still find it quite funny that someone in, like, 1961 would be so obsessed with Batman that he... Uses it as his nickname. It's mad, doesn't it? You forget how how just how long that's been. When, such when a did mass- Batman start? Thirties, like because there was some TV serials and things. Wasn't yeah, there, really? and yeah. like like um, I think sort of Saturday morning kind of like movie like serials as well. I think the sort of thing that might have cropped up on Captain Video. It, well, <laughs> possibly, yeah. Um, but like, I think. I'm not sure, like 38 to 1940, something like that, early Batman. So it could have been, he'd been around for a long time yeah, at this point. Yeah, it is really well established. Yeah, perhaps it would be an interesting exercise to look up these actual crimes and see whether that really influenced Evan Hunter or just influenced mm. the film, I don't know. The uh, yeah, the person writing this review of Young Savages isn't as kind to it as Anthony Boucher is normally to the 87th Precinct <laughs> books. He says, the problems of juvenile delinquency are tough enough to cope with these days. A film that sees these problems and then soft soaps them doesn't provide much valid <laughs> drama or do much good. Mm. So, yeah, th- that review would have sent everyone to the chair. Yeah, absolutely. I've got a review from The Observer as well, which is a British newspaper. It comes out on a Sunday. The script writers make it too easy for the main character. Virtue and vice are too evenly heaped, and what might have been a story about a momentous moral choice drifts casually into detective work and courtroom hysterics. Oh, there's some courtroom hysterics. To be fair, there are some courtroom hysterics, but I I don't know if it's exactly too easy. I think there's possibly a reason it doesn't lived in legend quite as much as Blackboard Jungle, really. Oh, well, not quite. Blackboard Jungle was the right film at the right time. This has perhaps missed the boat a little bit on internet. I think so. But I say that, I may be wrong. I don't know. I certainly found as well that whilst searching for stuff about the Young Savages, there was a like another article from June 1961 about an actual gang who've called themselves the Young Savages, quite possibly off the back of yeah. this film. You know, 28 
Bronx youths held. So that's, you know, that's a hell of a thing to be doing as a copper trying to <laughs> arrest 28 people, isn't it? You know, <laughs> the amount of police it would have taken to do that. Zip guns they were using. Zip guns. Which apparently are like one-shot guns. You, you, you load an actual cartridge in them, but they're sort of jerry-made, sort of put together from bits right. of wood. I don't really know what a zip gun is. No, no, no do I. Don't fire zips at people. <laughs> That would be a lot less threatening. Quite, probably quite painful, that. I mean, but yeah, it could sting a bit. They're quite abrasive, aren't they? I'd probably zip. prefer a zip to a cartridge, though. <laughs> in the, uh, the a zip you can things. only use once. I'm guessing it's maybe like the 1960s or late 50s equivalent of... Um, do you remember when there was a particular kind of potato gun that you could buy in, oh, yeah. in, in sort of pound shops that, that Scallies could convert to an actual gun? Oh. Scallies is... Scouse, sorry, sorry <laughs> Liverpool slang for scallywags, ne'er do wells. Ne'er do wells, absolutely. Uh, the, the, there was, um, I remember some years ago, probably over a decade ago now in Liverpool's story, that sort of bargain shops in the city were selling spud guns, like guns that were designed to fire little bits of potato at at people for yeah, for, 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 for japes, uh, which could very easily be converted to actually fire, I think, single bullets. And yeah. kill people. Um, so I imagine a zip gun would be some kind of late 50s equivalent of that. I'm, I have no idea. Quite possibly. Yeah, stop shooting each other, everyone. Yes, please. And that includes the police. Well, especially them, really, yeah. Yeah, especially, yeah. I looked down my notes here from the film, and I've got the phrase Ponce Grocers, which is an interesting <laughs> name for a grocery store. Mm, yep. Don't know what you're going to get in there. <laughs> Yeah, you do. <laughs> oh, dear. There's a very good scene with um, Hank Bell, Burt Lancaster's wife, where she's drunk. There's oh, a, there's, I a, that. there's a more political element to the film than there is to the book. Really? I mean, there, the book is political in, in the small p mm. sense, as in, you know, it will look good for the police, it will look good for the courts, and to see that these Italian hoodlums are being put away. Or, and um, the, it's big p political in the film in that it's actually the DA is trying to get elected to governor or whatever mm. you know, and, and this will really make his name if he gets his conviction and there's a scene where they're having a presumably an electoral rally or some sort of support thing and, and Hank Bell's wife Karen is drunk and starts making lots of sarcastic jibes about her husband electrocuting people for votes <laughs> <laughs> yeah she's not too subtle about it yeah, it's... But, you know, fair play to her. There's some very interesting female characters in the film. Unfortunately, his wife, Karen, really isn't one of them, I don't think. Whereas in the book, she's very, very important. Hmm. In the book, he met her while he was in in Germany, and she's German. Oh, right. And so their relationship hmm. is, he met her in Germany, and she came back with him from the war. Oh, okay, cool. Which gives a whole other slant to the story. Hmm. And he, he worries about things like her not being a virgin when, when he sort of met her and got with her. And that plays on his mind. So there's a big family thing missing from the film that's that's mm. woven throughout the book. Because he is, Hank Bell is a Harlem boy and he's trying to make something of his life. And he has because he's got to this quite privileged position in it for his job. But he's having all this trouble with his daughter who appears only very briefly in the mm. film. But some of the other female characters in the film are much better than his family's portrayed. Their story is totally stripped away in this. Mm. Yes. The young girl who's the prostitute, she's was very good in the courtroom scene. Mm. Especially Shelley Winters is quite good. Uh, is, Shelley yeah. Winters is always great. She's um, not going to swim through the water like well, in the Poseidon I mean, Adventure. Everyone who's in the Poseidon Adventure, it's it's all of their greatest movies, really. Yeah, like no, no one's ever going to like top that. It's a masterpiece. But this is a much <laughs> much younger Shelley Winters here. Her sort of sympathetic doe eyes she, playing just, to the character. She's of, just always terrific. There's she has this incredible knack of like creating this air of battered dignity with mm. the very slightest of gestures, which I think is always really winning. So the, her story is, or her character's story, is that she was going out with Hank Bell many, many years ago before he went off to the army. Not that, you, not that he mentions going off in the army in the film. It's not quite as clear what their relationship was. That's a big part of the book that's played out a bit more. In fact, in the book... The character Danny DiPacci, his dad still exists, he's still around, whereas he's written out of the film mm. as part of the reason why the kid might be yeah. the way he is. He hasn't got a dad. Mm. Whereas in the book, he has got a dad and he still turns out that way. <laughs> so there's a, there's a lot more moralising and, and, and thinking about mm. it in the book than there is in the film. 
you couldn't have packed it all in really into the film, but no. you could have made the same film again and done it differently. Of course. If you see what I mean, you could have picked up different threads. Hmm. So it's interesting. So let's keep going through the notes and have a little look we've got. In the book, the delay to getting the evidence they need in the courtroom is because of the lab analysis of the, of the old stabbing knives, the old switchblades. Mm, yeah. Whereas in the film, the switchblade knives are dumped and they can't find them to mm. begin with, which is what causes a delay. So that doesn't happen in the book at all? No, they, oh. they know where the knives are right from the off oh. in, in the in the book, more or less right from the off. And it's the lab that causes the delay. But the the book and the film both have a funny character. <laughs> so we were quite keen on the Ed McBain style zany, annoying character who was putting delays in the way of people finding the knives, ringing up Hank Bell in the middle of the night. Yeah, tell him if it's pretty them. good fun. We've, yeah, he's got a funny voice as well, hasn't he? I was, I'd do an impression, but I don't think I can remember it well enough. You found the nose. <laughs> well, he does go like that, doesn't he? Oh, I started doing it then automatically. Yeah, talks like he, he. Yeah, he's, he was wildly um, perky about the fact that they found the knives at some inappropriate hour of the, the morning. He was utterly cubistic. Cubistic, <laughs> even. He was, I would say yeah. it. To some degree, cubistic, yeah. The police precinct in this story is the 27th precinct, mm-hmm. which I have ascertained is one of those numbers that doesn't actually exist as a precinct okay. and is used quite a lot when films set in New York need oh, a precinct right. number because it doesn't exist. Excellent. And I believe it was used in the TV show Law and Order. Oh. So it's quite famous Amazing. in that sense. I wonder why there's not a 27th. Well, there's quite a few that don't exist, apparently, which... Did, would they have ex- ex- at some point and they've gone out of existence, or...? I don't know. It's something to do with the size of the areas that they're in, and so not all areas had all... So some of them have been and gone. Right. Yeah, and then yeah, some yeah. areas didn't need as many numbers and things like oh, that. Okay. There's quite a lot. You can, it's quite easy to find out about this stuff, but it's mm-hmm. quite hard to remember. Mm-hmm. But the 27th Precinct doesn't exist, but it's so close to 87th Precinct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think? Do you think Burt Lancaster would have made a good Steve Carella in a, in a decent film? He, he had a bit of the Carellas about yeah. him, didn't he? I, I guess... No, he's, yeah, he's always excellent, is Burt Lancaster, actually. He, he, is, he is good. He's got a, a good sort of craggy, decent charm, hasn't he? I, I, mm. I, I, I could see that working. He does hold a close-up very well, doesn't he? Yeah, absolutely. He can go right in on his face. I thought Telly Savalas was potential uh, Maya Maya material Well, you would well. have done it, yeah. I think yeah. Absolutely. yeah, I could see that. Kind of a bit sarcastic, wasn't he? And a bit, uh, you know, some of those... Well, Traits. Maya Maya and, and Telly Savalas have their own relationship as, as when Kojak's on air, it affects Maya Maya's life somewhat <laughs> in the stories of, course, of the 87th yeah. Precinct. He gets a bit fed up of the people asking him about cops, bald cops with Amazing. lollipops. <laughs> yep. So those worlds all tie in. Yeah, there were a few good 87th parallels. Uh, the annoying journalist as well yeah. um, reminded me of Cliff. Savage. Savage. Oops, Savage, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cliff, um, the young Savage. And we had a, yet, an, yet another Columbo <laughs> oh, yeah. link as well. So, go on, explain the Columbo link. Well, the, uh, the, well the, the, the main... Hoodlum. Ho- gang member. Hoodlum. He, uh, he, oh, his face was very familiar, wasn't he? And yeah. um, tiny bit of research. He was played a, a bomber in a Columbo episode who blows up... What does he do? I can't Blo- remember which one it is. He blows up something, uh, but then gets murdered by the do. actual baddie, so he wasn't the main <laughs> villain. He's got a very um, memorable face, though. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, it was the villain in the particular episode which this guy was in was the guy who was the villain more than anyone else. <laughs> that I can't remember his name. I know. And he plays, a, he plays a publisher who's trying to kill his best-selling author who was about to... Um, in the episode... Columbo, publish or perish. Yeah, and who's the baddie in that? Uh, the villain. I'm going to look it up for you now. Um, Let's have a little look. He's the flamboyant guy. I can tell you for a fact that Columbo was played by Peter Falk. Uh, <laughs> Which isn't always fact. the case. There are there are examples where he wasn't before the actual main Columbo came on. Um, Jack Cassidy. Yeah, Jack Cassidy. Yeah, yeah, so he's. But one of the actors in in that episode of Columbo playing the character Alan Mallory is Mickey Spillane. Amazing. Which is interesting. <laughs> and yeah, wild. and John Davis Chandler, who we're talking about here, plays Eddie Kane, the bomber. Yeah. Which, as we've ascertained, the worlds of Ed McBain and Columbo are 
aren't just limited to the adaptations in the TV series. There's loads of threads so that many. could drive a man mad trying to track them all and down. And probably will. Yes, this, is, this may be my ultimate fate. <laughs> Fortunately, there's lots more people than, you know, lots of people out there who are also total Columbo obsessives and uh, quite easy to tap into for information yeah. because they've got all of it <laughs> yeah. already researched. I can well believe it. Um, on the subject of that, that main uh, hoodlum from this, I feel like I should just publicly register my feeling that for, for a lead hoodlum, he really didn't have good enough pomade. No, for 19, 1961, a teen punk needs like a more glistening pompadour than that. It was it was lacking. It was uh, what, what? What his hair? Oh, like it was flapping around in the breeze. Come on! I know you, you can do better. Your authority would be stripped away every time the hair caught. What, what, what was caught kind in, of teen punk can you be? The horseman guy. Uh, he had a good uh, mate, Now, didn't now. He? There's a team punk you can set your watch by. Before he slicked it back when uh, Bert Tremendous. went into his hair was he's down He's got like here. Kurt Cobain hair and then like a couple of strokes of the comb and he's got this glistening, That's the majestic... Chap that, the chap that looked like Adam Driver, wasn't he? was it? wonderful, yeah. I, I'd, I'd join his gang. So well, he, he was a bit more he was a bit more believable at that age, I thought. Definitely, uh, yeah. Somehow. Yeah, yeah he, he definitely was. He was very good. He was an excellent punk. And he had very, very shiny hair, as you've just said. So Out good. of all of us here, Morgan, you're the only one who's ever really had a bit of a, a black hair quiff thing going on. Yeah, it, it's it's sadly diminished not being at my teen pomp. But, I, know, I still uh, think you could perhaps try a bit harder with the... Uh, <laughs> Although I think the brill cream be in chance for casting for this, I think. <laughs> you're about, yeah, you're about, about the right age. About the right age, yeah. Age 39, we'll play... We'll play 15-year-old punk. <laughs> Start, get some eight by tens uh, printed up and send them out to the, uh, the yeah. film well, company. Well, the, the second to the last time you saw this guy, he was like slumped in the courtroom with a, like a sock in his mouth no, due to his right. uh, his outburst in the courtroom. This is apparently how uh, legal procedure worked in the states. He's like days. <laughs> totally oblivious to what's happening. Like, uh, yeah. yeah, this is this is Arthur Reed and John <laughs> Davis Chandler's character who, who gets up and starts shouting. <laughs> they literally just. Just and the judge goes, gone. gag the suspect, or he says... <laughs> that doesn't happen in the book. I, I think he, he warned them in advance that if there were any more outbursts, he'd be gagged and bound. And literally one second later, uh, he has another outburst. Yep, lowers his specs, gag the suspect. Uh, off, off he goes, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Suck. Hanky shoved in his cob. <laughs> and proceeding to <laughs> carry on. Well, yeah, it's it's outrageous. Bad. It's... Understandable why the district attorney Hank Bell feels that he's got to get this court case right because he's beaten up uh. as part of this because the gangs want to see justice from one side or another and they obviously they threaten his wife and then they come after him and they beat him up with chains on a on a on a subway train. Well, I don't know if it's a subway; it was just a train, wasn't it? Was it a subway? I don't know. I, I, I was thinking subway. But I thought subway. You never really find out who did that, do you? No, you don't. And it's got to be irrelevant, I suppose, but not really important. Yeah. It could have been any of them. Well, that's what he says, doesn't he? It could have been either, because he's. I think he'd pissed them both off that day, hadn't he? So he's, he he's, ro ruff, he's ruffling, royally beaten, isn't he? Ruffling feathers. He is. Although he protects the face. He does. And has a cigarette at the earliest opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, this is brilliant. He's examining his lungs. <laughs> he's, he's lying on the on the examination table in the doctor's with Telly Savalas there and his family as well, his wife and daughter. And he's like, Doctor... Is it all right if I smoke? And he's not, the doctor's like, yeah. Amazing. If you must. Just taking a chest x-ray, just taped, taping up his ribs while he starts smoking. It's like, ah. Oh. It's brilliant. It's absolutely outrageous. Brilliant. I was hoping he would have one of Telly Savalas' cigars just <laughs> to, you know, nail the point home even more. <laughs> that's sort of, out of everything, that's the sort of thing that makes it feel distant in time. Oh, <laughs> yeah. You can actually be being examined by the doctor and ask for a cigarette mm. at the same time as well. <laughs> in the book, he's set on in the park, so there's no witnesses, whereas uh -huh. in this, he's on the train and people see these people. Yeah. Which is a bit odd. Well, they're kind of there when it starts, and, but then they kind of ignore... Maybe, for, like, for people just kind of... People tend to kind of have this thing about the subway where if something happens there, they just people get out of the way or pretend they haven't seen it. I, I suppose maybe that's kind of the comment there. I suppose they were swinging uh, chains yeah, around. Yeah, so. you, you might be inclined to get the hell out of the way. Yes, yeah, so you might move down the train to a, a different uh, carriage. Indeed. 
So a couple more bits that I've noticed. They skipped a whole sequence in the book about where they have to choose the jury, which oh. is always a weird thing in the... Mm. If you ever see... I've seen it in a couple of uh, TV things from America, and I, I certainly don't think it ever happened here, where you can challenge the jury. You have Part of the trial is, and it can last weeks, mm. is people bringing in potential jurors, them being cross-examined to see whether they're fit to sit on the jury mm. because they're too much of a certain background mm. or they might have sympathies in a certain way. And it seems like a very strange thing. Yeah. It goes on for quite a bit in, a bit in the book. They skip that in the film. You don't get an hour of, of them just bringing in people you'll never see again and saying, you know, where do you come from? What Where's that doing? director's cut? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably, yeah, it probably exists somewhere. You could include all the outtakes, like where Shelley Winters fails to open a door. <laughs> yes. Which I'm implying happened, happened because you could see a cut in the film where she goes to open a door. Yeah. So I suspect there's probably... If only a there's a blooper reel as well. That's exactly the thing. That's what we want. A bit where Burt Lancaster falls down some steps. <laughs> so you want the uh, the ten-disc edition of The Young Savages. Definitely. You do. Redux. Yeah, the bit, bit where all the teen punks uh, come over, like, fly up in the wind, and you can see that they're actually, like, bald middle-aged men. <laughs> all that stuff. I think somewhere this was compared to West Side Story without the music... I don't think it's... It's it's not really... No. We talked about West Side Story in relation to See Them Die as well. It's just... It's of the same background. Yeah, absolutely. Gangs and stuff like that. But in this, it's a bit more about the moral and social reasons f- yeah. for these things. It's interesting that his main character, Hank Bell, has changed his name from, from uh, Hank Bellini. Yes. Mm. And, of course, Evan Hunter was Salvatore Lombino, mm. uh, Lombini. I can't even remember. I've done so much research <laughs> in his family tree now. And the thing with family tree research is you've got to rely on the fact that the people doing the censuses and surveys and writing down the information are actually listening to the people who are telling them their uh-huh. names. Salvatore Lombino is, is what it is. And that they're going to spell it right. Uh-huh. So if you've come over from Italy and you're talking to someone and you're saying, my name's Giuseppe, they, and if the person writes down Joe, then that throws the research uh-huh. totally out. Absolutely. I found out, certainly, Salvatore Lombini wasn't, or Lombino, oh, I'm still doing it, <laughs> wasn't the first in his family to change his name to an anglicised version anyway. Well, not that Evan Hunter's an no, anglicised version, either. it's about not as far away as you can get, yeah. but uh, yeah, there was angli- anglicisation anyway. And that's played out here. Obviously, it's an important thing for a lot of mm. people to get out of the slums, and one of the way they did it, ways they did it was by making themselves appear more white American, Definitely. really. It's it's something that does crop up in in some of the McBain novels and also in uh, uh, Streets of Gold by Evan Hunter that that you, you gave me as well. Indeed, I think it's something that's constantly probably played on on um, the author's mind over the years. Uh, that's something that, that he's probably thought about a lot. Yeah, so, well, yeah I listen, it does crop up a lot. I, I listened think. again recently to the podcast in the psychiatrist chair, which was an old BBC radio series, mm. and you can still get this podcast and the interview with Evan Hunter. And it opens with the interviewer asking him about his name. How do you think of yourself? Because I think of you as Ed McBain. And he says he just says, Evan Hunter. He said, I, I changed my name because I didn't like my name. <laughs> it wasn't just for professional purposes. Yeah. Although, obviously, it was triggered by it. He didn't like his name. He, didn't, he felt it tied in too much to that yeah. background. Not that he didn't like his family either, because yeah. he, did, he did. Yeah, so that's very interesting, and it's still out there. Mm. I mentioned it probably a long time ago now. So if you want to listen to it, anyone, cool. it's still there. Look it up. It's called in the psychiatrist in the psychiatrist's chair. <laughs> we have a psychiatrist and psychologist crop up in this film as well. Mm. Another mm. kooky character. There's a lot of sort of psychoanalysis anal- going on in this, which I think was very much in the air at the time. I guess they so. Have, yeah. A bunch of stuff about raw shark tests and IQ tests yeah. as a way of seeing whether people are, you know... It's probably fairly new stuff, that, then. I, I suspect think. it was, yeah. yeah. Well, certainly in the, the sort of mainstream consciousness. Yeah, exactly, least, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. like... Uh, Applying it to real-world situations. Yeah, it would have just yeah, been definitely. purely theoretical, I would, I would have thought. Absolutely, yeah. The early first half of the 20th century. I will give you some interesting post-film story here. Okay. Get these little clips in the right order, otherwise the story will make no sense. Again from the New York Times, which is just very convenient because it's all online and I can access it anyway. The title of this article is Gang Film Actor is Held in Killing. (gasps) 
An East Harlem youth who portrayed an East Harlem hoodlum in a film dealing with gang warfare was charged yesterday oh. with the fatal stabbing of a 16-year-old boy during a melee on a door stoop. <laughs> who was it? A door stoop? Well, sounds exactly like the film. Mm. The police said that Ramon Ortiz, 22 years old, had received $300 for a minor role in The Young Savages. Mm. Like the film, the real-life incident in East Harlem focused on the death of a Puerto Rican youth in the continuing conflict between Puerto Ricans and Italian-Americans in the area. The police said that Ortiz, who is known in the neighbourhood as the actor, mm. <laughs> and then it goes on and talks about the people he was with. So oh, no. that was in uh, on August the 3rd, 1965, that article. Wow. So mm. someone who was playing a gang member Bloody basically hell. lived that out. Outrageous. Or did he... Well, dun, dun, dun. I might pass this to Steve-O to oh, right. reveal the answer. Oh, right, well. <laughs> Here we go. City is sued for a million on false arrest charge. Excellent. Uh, a 23-year-old father of three who spent eight months in jail accused of the murder of which he was later exonerated sued the city for one million US dollars in damages yesterday. Raymond Ortiz, who had a minor role in The Young Savages, a Burt Lancaster film, bad, bad, bad. Uh, was charged fatal stabbing 16-year-old in East Harlem doorstep. First degree murder uh, against Mr. Ortiz and another youth were dismissed after the district attorney's office said they were in no way implicated in the killing of Walter Cordero. Well, there we go. I wonder how it doesn't really explain. No, I'm sure a, a bit of research might turn up a little bit more. But the, the, the lawyer for Mr. S uh, Mr. Ortiz said um, his client was greatly humiliated, embarrassed, Aww. scorned, and suffered great mental and physical distress. Well, poor Mr. Ortiz. Well, he perhaps shouldn't have been going around with a gang going, I'm the actor. <laughs> well, hey, I'm the actor here. I suppose. Crikey. Well. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. So, talk about the book and the movie are art mimicking real life yeah. and then real life is mimicking art <laughs> mimicking real life you could think of it in those terms perhaps well right. I think what we really need to do then is is we that need... Kenneth I can see being yeah, Kenneth, warmed up yeah, oh. is. what Kenneth is waiting for though is a determination of, of what unit we're going to use to rate oh the film oh my goodness we should well, probably have thought about this beforehand shouldn't we I wouldn't knives have... there was quite a few knives yeah knives are a, a central theme knives are uh... Plentiful. I was wondering if we could perhaps rate the film in terms of how many revolutions per minute the high-speed miniature carousel that we see in the film is going <laughs> Well, round. yeah, that's, that's terrifying. going very yeah, fast. It was, it was about two metres across. It had about 18 children on it, and it was going hell for leather. It was, that, that, those kids like were holding on for dear life. They did well. <laughs> so I've got, I've got, we've got knives. We've got revolutions per minute of a high-speed miniature carousel. Oh, well, that's quite hard for me to input into Kenneth. It takes a lot of uh, punched card to, uh, to enter it. I think we might stick with knives. Uh, should we call it switchblades? Just switch to make it more exciting. Yeah. And more accurate. In so, fact. At, what, out of ten switchblades? Well, no, let's keep it out of a hundred. You oh, can use switchblades. Switch we've, look, we've programmed Kenneth for a hundred That's now. true. Is, I mean, we don't want to like, no. go through all the... Don't, don't have to like power him down and reprogram everything. Right, well... I so, suppose... Mm. Steve, I hand over to you to give a little bit of a summary and a, and so a, for, for a my, what my switchblade rating of the film, yeah, and enjoyment thereof. Mm. Uh, well, it was it was highly enjoyable. Um, I do quite like John Frankenheimer's direction. I like that in the train. There's a bit of sort of like and there's yeah, there's few wacky camera angles that always seem a bit out of place for a film of that age. I thought that when I saw the train, and there's, it's, it's difficult to explain what they were. Just every now and then, you're like, oh, that's a bit different. Some stylish direction, quite definitely. Yeah. You know, a lot, a lot of kind of close, real close-ups, just totally out the blue. Yeah, and um, and just sort of like interesting angles with people like charging down stairs and things. It a bit like those adverts cool. that dentists have, like in about <laughs> toothpaste. There's always loads of jaunty camera angles. Now they're terrible, but I know I I do know what you mean. I know. They, they always do your edit. They're never and they're a straight really camera angle. As well because they've used oh, from they're the, awful, the absolutely awful, away. but similar to that. <laughs> Um, so you're saying John Frankenheimer's direction <laughs> legacy is in Colgate adverts? Yeah, probably. Anyhow. So yeah, I enjoyed that. There was some ridiculous aspects to it as well that we've mentioned. <clears throat> and you kind of wonder, I was watching it, wondering whether how genuinely accurate it was in terms of how much 
kind of control these kid gangs had on these areas? Because wouldn't the actual organised crime have stood for that? Do you, do um, well, you know what I mean? We don't know. I mean, from what our researches mm. are and how it's impacted on the stuff we looked at so far, it seems like it was pretty bad at certain points, yeah. not so bad at other times. But yeah, I've never thought I about that. I think there's possibly, I mean, there may be some areas where the... the Kid gangs would sort of eventually feed into the sort of higher yeah. organised crime, and like the kid gangs would probably just sort of have some authority on a street level, and then yeah, I suppose they, they probably just had authority over the people that they could have authority over, yeah. i.e. their pe- their blocks. peers, you know. Well, you know, people of their age. Yeah, you know, pretty, pretty I can't much. imagine they were going around racket money from established businesses. I, I wouldn't imagine just, so, but I, I, yeah, you'd uh, I don't think know, just, uh, just if a there was anyway. larger organised crime that they could feed into maybe, it. They, yeah. Maybe they were the, you know, like the sort of people moving the drugs around rather yeah, than the people buying possibly, and selling yeah. them. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. I don't know in quantity. about it to speculate, but I so, think that might be. Yes, I think in terms of my enjoyment, I would put it around the 68. Oh, 68 switchblades. <sighs> Have all of them got blood on? We don't know. <laughs> have I have I matched you know, your switchblades? Well, let's see. Uh, that size. I, I was of. very much thinking of going for something. Uh, I'm gonna have to, I'm, I'm, as I discuss it, I'll think about it a little bit more, and we'll <laughs> we'll see if I feel like changing it's, my score. Yeah, it's got all um, variables. I did enjoy. I, I, I think it's it's pretty cool. It's the premise is good. I think it's you know the. The, the actual sort of um, social and political kind of themes in there, that's that's pretty interesting. And I think it's artfully made, some good performances. I, as we've discussed, I, mean, I would have either preferred for it to go more youth exploitation and have, like, zany rock and roll yeah. and more, like, hilariously well, not full bombs go beat. But, no, yeah. no, no, but, like, a little bit more of a that. more Blackboard Jungle. Absolutely. Or make it more gritty and just, like, a little bit more hard-hitting. It could have gone either way. Mm. Um, I think that reflects what a lot of people think. About it became it. a bit courtroomy yeah. towards the end, yeah. didn't it? I mean, so, I don't know, I mean, like, maybe, I've not read the book, maybe it's, like, a very early sort of hint of Evan Hunter sort of heading towards, like, the Matthew Hope novels and, mm, and things like that later on. But that's, um, that's true, yeah. it, it was good fun. I've, I've very much enjoyed it, and I'm very glad to have seen it. I'm not going to change much, but I feel like I should give a slightly different score just because I don't want to <laughs> seem like I'm ripping you off. I'm going to give it uh, 66 Switchblades. 66, okay. Now, I've read the click. book of this and the book which I'm not going to rate because we've not all read it I will say it's clearly an Evan Hunter book not an Ed McBain book Mm. there is a different type of author's voice in this which in this case I don't enjoy as much as the Ed McBain Mm. voice it's He's got different things to explore, and he explores them in a different in a different way when he's writing as Evan Hunter rather than Ed McBain, which is why maybe it's a little bit strange that it's now published as Ed McBain writing as Evan Hunter. I can understand the the commercial and mm. the you know historical reasons for doing that. Mm. So I've got the book in my mind because I read it first, and I don't think the film dis- disappointed me. It it was a good stab at, at getting across a story in an hour and twenty minutes, or not whatever it was. It was an hour and twenty minutes, an hour and forty minutes that it was. I did think it missed out some of the potential for the actual social stuff that it really could have gone into that the the book tries to do and does in quite intense detail Mm. and tries to boil that down to two or three sort of little moments that are sort of a line here or a look there or or whatever. But that said, I think, you know, it it wasn't bad at all. But I don't think I'm going to creep above... 65 switchblades. Oh, well. In this instance. We're all in a fairly similar ballpark. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's fair enough. So let's see what Kenneth's got to say about that. I mean, wow. Kenneth's probably not used to the idea of us trying to pour in, you know, 180 odd switchblades into his mechanisms, but let's, He's just let's, gonna have to deal with let's it, see he? what happens as we watch the smoke pouring out of his funnels. <laughs> and it comes out at, well, Morgan, you've nailed it. 66 switchblades. I awarded to the Young Savages. The there. Excellent. I think it's worth watching. It is. It's definitely worth watching. Yeah, and give it a watch, folks, definitely. It's it's not going to change your life, but it, you'll not regret having spent that one hour and 38 minutes. Um, definitely, it's, it's a good movie. Okay, well, that's us summed up for the film. We will be back very soon with The Empty Hours, the next 87th Precinct book, mm. with the three no- novellas in it Ooh. from 1962. And moving on from there... I suppose, until then, we might as well say goodbye. I'll do that like this. Goodbye. 
Goodbye. And fare thee well. <laughs>